So we were talking about AAA servers, right? So like with firewalls, we talked about firewall concepts and then Cisco firewalls. Similarly for AAA, we're talking about AAA concepts and then the Cisco AAA server, which is which we call ICE, it is Cisco's identity services engine. So ICE does whatever a AAA server does, plus a lot of other things. So it gives you visibility into your entire network. What, how many devices are connecting? What kind of devices are connecting? What products are they? What exact vendors or OUIs are there? Which IP address, how much time, which location? Every info ICE will give you. It will give you a dashboard, it will give you visibility into every single thing that is going on in your network. That is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is, it will help, it will act as a AAA server. It will help you authenticate your users. It will help you authorize your users. It will log all activity. So you will have historical logs of what is happening in your network as well. So three things, it gives you visibility. It gives you control. So you can do network segmentation. This particular part or this particular location of my offices should operate in this way. That is one thing. And it also ensures compliance. Now compliance is an interesting thing and we'll talk about it more. But uh, compliance is basically if you are in a company and the company tells you we have given you a company asset, a company laptop and it should always be updated with the latest Windows security patch, right? And if it's not updated, it's not compliant according to our organization's security policies. So that is the concept of compliance and ICE implements that concept in a particular way which we will discuss further. Apart from that, ICE is also capable of handling endpoints which are wired, wireless, VPN. Again, endpoints is a term that refers to any end device, your laptops, tablets, PCs, desktops, everything, printers, CCTV cameras, IP phones. Any endpoint, any end device in a network is the term endpoint is applicable to that. ICE also provides guest access. So this is something that you have experienced while coming to this winter school. You got guest access into VIT's network, right? You were provided with credentials. You saw a portal, a captive portal where you put in those credentials and you're able to log in. And then certain bandwidth of internet speed is assigned to you. So that entire guest portal management, that is also a functionality that ICE can provide you. So a, a very vast and a very versatile product uh, we have, which also does AAA of course. So features of ICE, device administration, we've already discussed this, securely accessing the network, guest access, asset visibility, again, everything I've already uh, mentioned. Compliance and posture, context exchange. So context exchange is interesting in the sense that uh, your AAA server, your Cisco ICE, can communicate with a Cisco firewall or another device to gather contextual information. So basically information from the AAA server as well as firewall can be consolidated and can be viewed holistically. So that integration capability is context exchange. Segmentation, BYOD is bring your own device. So if you're bringing your own mobile phones or your own laptops, how is that getting administered? How is that complying with your company's security policy? So that is the concept of BYOD. So ICE architecture. So uh, we'll not go too deep into this, but to generally understand how it works, Cisco ICE has four kinds of node. It's the same product, but we can configure it in four different personas. So the top one says PSN, but we'll start with the second one. The second one is policy administration node. This is your main node. This is your manager. Like in a company, there is a manager and there are employees reporting to that manager. The manager is the one who coordinates with all those employees, assigns them tasks, and uh, you know, keeps, keeps tabs on what is happening, who is working on what, right? So your policy administration node is your manager. So it will communicate with all other nodes 
it will make sure that all the rules that you compose on this administration node are synced to all other nodes. It will do everything. So it is the administrator as the name suggests, it is the administrator node and it is the replication hub for all database config changes. So whatever you are configuring on the AAA server, you will do it on the pan, on the policy administration node. Next up, we come to the policy services node. These are the PSN, these are the workers, these are the employees basically. The manager will tell them that you go to this location and you do this and you will do that. So the PSN is something similar. So the PAN will tell them the rules, these are the rules, authentication rules, authorization rules. The PSN will go and apply those rules. So the switches, the actual switches in the network or the routers or whatever devices are there in the network. In reality, they are communicating with the PSN, the policy services node. They are getting their inputs, they are communicating with the PSN. Whatever policy is being applied, is being executed, is being done through the PSN. So these are the actual radius and TACAC servers and they make the policy decisions, accept, deny, all of that, change of authorization, all of that PSN is doing. The admin node is just telling it, this is the set of rules, this is everything, sync everything. So that is how it's happening. The third type is the monitoring and the troubleshooting node. So when we say AAA, we talked a lot about authentication and authorization. But the third pillar is accounting. So the MNT node plays a very important role in that. So it reports and logs everything that is happening. And it is also a syslog connector, collector for the ICE node. So not only does it log all the endpoint interactions, it also logs what is happening across the ICE deployment, what is happening to the other nodes. So everything that is going on, and we also call it the troubleshooting node because in case there is a problem with the deployment, we can go to this node, we can get the relevant logs, and then we can solve the problem. So, Three, these are the three major kinds of nodes. The fourth kind is the op, is, is an optional node. Uh, not every deployment has that. It's called the PX grid node. So uh, this is again for if you want to integrate the firewall into it and you want to exchange information between firewall and ICE. So then you can have another dedicated node called the PX grid node. So there are two ways to utilize these four personas. The first basic way is that if you are a small organization, you can just have one ice box and then you can enable all the personas on the same box. So administration is also the same box, uh, PSN is also the same thing, monitoring is also the same thing. So this can be done in case you have a small deployment, you can easily manage it with just one ice node with all personas enabled on it. The other way is a distributed ice deployment where you can do a division of labor. You are a very big organization and maybe one node cannot handle all of the users that are all of the employees that are there in your organization. And maybe you are an organization that is spread across the globe. You have offices in India, in the US, in Europe, in Australia, everywhere you have offices. So how will just one box, one physical box communicate across the world? So in that case, a more sensible approach is to use the distributed deployment where you can have once a dedicated node for every persona. So your PAN is one node, you have five, six, ten PSNs in different locations. So all of those are dedicated PSNs. You are you have two, three, two monitoring nodes. So uh, for PAN, you can only have two nodes, one primary PAN and one secondary PAN. So administration node, at most you can have two. And similarly for MNT also, you can have a primary MNT and you have you can have a secondary MNT. And PSNs you can have multiple depending on the scale of your deployment. So uh, that is how a distributed deployment. There's another way that you can have the PAN and the MNT on the same node, but the PSNs can be separate. So uh, it's up to you how you want to implement based on the size of your network, based on your budget based on the scalability that you have want to have in the deployment. So based on that, uh, so at the bottom you'll see these are just uh, the hardware models that we have in Cisco, right? And uh, each model uh, for standalone and distributed, how many concurrent endpoints that server can support, that is the count that is written there at the bottom. 
So again, based on your requirements, you can choose a particular type of deployment. You can choose a particular hardware. Uh, this is again the same thing. So you, if you have a small environment, if it's just an evaluation or a lab environment, you're just testing something out, then a standalone deployment works. Then a small HA deployment. So uh, we talked about HA, right? Active, standby, active, active, right? So for AAA also, we can use an HA where we can have two nodes and all, both the nodes have all the personas enabled, but they are in a configuration where if one node goes down, the other node can take over or both of the nodes can work, function simultaneously as well. And uh, we can also have a medium multi-node deployment. So again, it's the same thing. Depending on the scale of your deployment, you can, have, you can vary the number of your nodes and the size of your deployment. So to give an overview of the AAA components, the first term we learned was endpoints. Endpoints are also called supplicants. To remember it easily, they are called supplicants because they are supplying the credentials. They are supplying the information to get authenticated or authorized into the network. So endpoints are supplicants. They can be users, devices, things like I said. They can be printers, IP phones, cameras, anything can be an endpoint or a supplicant. The second is the network access devices, which is the first step. And that can be a switch, WLC, VPN, gateway, firewall, anything can be a network access device. This is the device that will create your radius packet based on the information and it will communicate with ICE. So this is the next level, the network access devices. This will again, like I said, it will formulate the radius packet or the TACAX packet and it will talk to the AAA server. AAA server in this case can be an ICE virtual machine or an ICE hardware box or it can be some other AAA server also. And lastly, Again, this is something that I mentioned in that diagram also. So there can be a scenario where you have such a large deployment, where you have so many users that you need a dedicated server to manage all their identities, to manage their usernames, passwords, certificate, credentials, which is your active directory or any external identity store. So ICE can further integrate with that external identity store. So if your AAA server receives a packet which says this is the username, this is the password, I need you to authenticate. So ICE will go to that external identity store, it will check, it will validate that yes, this password is there, this user is there in the ID store. Based on that, ICE can further send the response back that yes, this is a valid, this user can be authenticated. So ICE can further integrate or actually other AAA servers also, any AAA server can further integrate into an external identity store, so which is the fourth component. So it can be LDAP, SAML, RADIUS, anything it can be there. So these are the broad AAA components. Now we'll talk about what I was mentioning earlier, compliance. So before I go into that, any questions so far? Okay. So we talk about ICE posture. Does your device meet the security requirements that were set by your organization? So any organization will have a security policy. They will want to follow a set of security best practices, security rules, and they will define that, that all our users, uh, if they are using Windows systems or Mac systems, this is the bare minimum level of security that they should have to be able to connect into our internal networks. So compliance defines the state of the endpoint with the company's security policy. And how ICE implements this is through the concept of posture. So you determine, ICE analyzes a particular endpoint, for example, somebody's laptop. ICE will analyze that laptop and see that, okay, what all processes are running, what all softwares are installed. In, if it's an antivirus, for example, what patch version is that antivirus? Is it the latest patch? Is it a current patch? So otherwise it's no use, right? It's very important to keep your antivirus updated. So is the system running the current patches? Do you have AV software? Is it up to date? Do you have anti-spyware? So you can define a set of rules and say that this is the posture I want for my organization. And then utilizing this AAA server, you can enforce that. So again, it's a simple uh, 
visual to understand. So posture has requirements and requirements have two components, checks and remediation. A check is, do you have a firewall installed? Do you have an antivirus installed? Is a particular process running on your system? That is a check. What happens if you are not doing that? What happens if that check is failing? So the next step is remediation. So you are like, okay, you don't have antivirus. I am giving you partial access. Here is the link. Download the antivirus and install it. That is one way. The second way is that, okay, some XYZ process is not running on your system, but it should be running. So the check has failed. So what you can do is, if you have that option, if that configuration is there, you can enable it in the background. You can just say that, you know, particular check failed. Do you want to enable it? Automatically, it will get enabled. So two components, checks and remediation. And IES as a product is capable of doing both of those things. It can check whether the device is compliant or non-compliant. And in case it is non-compliant, it is capable of enforcing the remediation actions. What actions do you take to make it compliant? So that is the remediation concept. So this brings us to the end of ICE and uh, I will show a small demo of what the product looks like. Okay, I think uh, we can stop that. So this brings us to the end of AAA and ICE. So uh, we will begin the next session. But uh, before that, any questions so far since the morning? Uh, have you been able to grasp what we are teaching you? Too much information. Too much information. <laughs> we do have some labs also, but we will cover the concepts first and then we'll move on to some of the labs. Right. Okay. Fine. So we talked a lot about the AAA part, how ICE is a product of Cisco and it does a lot of things related to the user end and even it involves, you know, devices in the black box that we were discussing, right? So back to the firewall that uh, Pooja explained, right? What it does, basic functionalities, ACL, FTD, um, uh, NAT, sorry. And uh, FTD is a new, rendition of ASA. So for example, ASA started off like a lot of years back. Uh, it did everything that it could, like what we wanted from a security device and way more than that. But uh, like a lot of companies need innovation, they need to run the game, right? So Cisco FTD or Firepower Threat Defense is a next generation firewall. Firewall did everything. Next generation firewall means it does something extra at user level, at device level, at application layer, stuff like that. Okay, so that's what we are going to discuss. So if you remember um, here, I'll be back to that uh, uh, diagram. So we had uh, AAA servers here, right? We had database one, database two, AD, uh, all that. Now, where do you think the firewall can act or can be placed just before, you know, just after the router. Is there any other place where this firewall can be placed? Like, think about a scenario. In that same diagram itself. Right after the internet. Right after internet. One step below the internet, yes. So once we um, figure out what are the devices that are in our networks, right? There are devices that you can repeat. There are devices that you can place at different uh, locations depending on what do you want that device to do, right? For example, if you have that critical network segments, right? These are your endpoints, okay? You can have a, route, uh, a firewall here as well. Okay, if you want the firewall in that, uh, uh, the L2 operation that we discussed, right? It can act as a transparent firewall. You can have that. If you want just to L2 routing, you can place the firewall there. Uh, if you want to have the firewall act as the ultimate internet 
device. For example, that is a device that will get you internet access. So all dynamic packed, right? Remember how you get the internet? You can have the device there as well. Okay, I don't want internet access on my firewall. I just want only private services on that firewall. I can put the firewall here. So it will do most of the layer three networking. It will do routing. It can handle still AD services, like it can talk to the internal uh, Active Directory, it can talk to ICE, it can talk to any AAA server for that matter. And then you can place the firewall there. So depending on how are you designing your network, the firewall can be placed anywhere. Okay, but you have to be sure what are the dedicated services that the firewall is running. So FTD, it's, uh, it's a new device that uh, Cisco launched. You can run FTD images as well on ASA boxes. So for example, you just get a cabinet, uh, for, you get a laptop, you run, you can root it, you can run Ubuntu, you can run uh, Mac, any OS, right? Or if you have virtual box, similar to that. There are FTD images available, software images. There are hardware as well. So you can mix and match depending on what, how much licensing you have, right? How much, uh, how, how many users are you actually connecting to the device? If you don't want a lot of users, you're a small organization. So you can run a smaller uh, licensing on that. So yes, like we discussed, it can be at the perimeter. It can be at the router level. It can even be here acting as an L2 device. It can be somewhere here as a DMZ firewall. It can run as just as a DMZ firewall as well. Or if you're fancy enough, go and place it at the internet. In most cases, in practical cases, what do you think? Where is the firewall appropriately placed? Like mostly, where do you think it might be placed? Or if you were to design it, where would you place it? between internet and private, very good. So here is the most appropriate area where, where the maximum usage of that firewall because you do want internet traffic to be filtered. You want internet access like the PAT or anything. But in addition to the firewall, in most cases, what we have is an internet, fire, uh, internet router. It's called an edge router. So how you get your TP-Link or any router that you have at home, right? How do you get access to the internet is, even if you have firewalls on your systems, but the ultimate goal, ultimate how you get the internet access is through router. So you have an internal router, you have firewall, and then you have an external router, taking care of all the um, access to internet. But the security aspect is taken care by the firewall itself, okay? So yes, ASA was doing all good things, right? It was doing uh, L2 to L4, you can get the uh, statefulness, you can get tuples, you know what is going, what is coming back, you do routing, all good. And then it also did application inspection, like we were talking about if you don't want to go to that site and you created ACLs, right? Blocking that site, denying that site, you can do application inspection. What firepower is, is you guys read snot, right? Snot was discussed a few days back. The No? Okay. So, uh, uh, so firepower was another company that was running some extra services. Okay, so what it would do is, if you give it a packet at L3 or L4 level, it will inspect that by default, and it will tell you if that packet is a malicious packet or if it's a benign packet. Okay, so these little services, it also did if you have an endpoint that is connecting uh, to say a AAA server, and then somehow it's connecting to the firewall, what are the processes that are running that need to be checked before going to the AAA server? Okay, for example, your PCs, they do anti-malware checks, anti-virus checks and everything, right? So similarly, if that information we need to send it to the firewall, it did that also. 
Okay, uh, so in depth inspection is the work of something called firepower snot, it is renamed couple of times. So, snot is something that we use as a name because uh, the symbol itself is a pig snorting all the back packets. Okay, so combining ASA which does most of the uh, basic ASA jobs and using firepower or snot as doing all the advanced jobs. URL filtering, okay, advanced malware protection, um, antivirus checks, all event detection in case there is a malicious activity, how do you get to those events, all these things were incorporated into the FTD, that is why it is called a next generation firewall, it uses next generation ciphers, anyone knows any next generation cipher, AES itself is a normal cipher. So, next generation is the bits that is incorporated. So, 256 bits that is the next generation cipher. SHA-256, SHA-512 all these are next generation ciphers. So, support of those ciphers inbuilt to the device that was something new. Okay. So, FTD does you know all these fancy things and in most of the deploy deployments we now see FTDs taking over ASAs. <laughs> Uh, just because it does more things and it is easier to migrate from ASA to FTD, manage FTD. So, one thing, um, yeah, okay, fine. So, we call in our lingo Lina. Uh, so, basically, if anything that FTD uh, does that is with in accordance to ASA, it is called a Lina engine. Anything that does from firepower perspective, it is called a snot engine. Okay. So, uh, separately when we talk about ASA and uh, snot, their uh, background machinery is a bit different. They do not work at the same time. They do not work in the same CPU. Okay. Their architecture is different. But when you combine it for the admin when they see an FTD, right? For them, both of these things will look at the same place. So, that is the beauty of FTD where you would not know what is in the Lina and what is in the um, snot. So, you can go to the snot services, you can add the Lina services and everything. So, two methods uh, that uh, we generally how we manage FTD. So, for example, ICE was she said right PAN is there, then PSNs are the endpoints. So, FTD has two operations, two ways to operate it rather. One is on box, one is off box. So, what do you think is the difference? Any guesses? Like, so on box would mean uh, how you access your device directly, right? You go, you log in directly, you do that. Off box means your manager is somewhere else and you are talking to them. They are not in the same premises, okay. They are uh, you, someone else is managing your device, your FTD and other FTDs as well. So, it is a, uh, the way we, uh, the way we manage the FTD is a bit different than how we manage ASAs. So, there are two uh, there are two things how we manage it. One is firepower device manager. It is called a local manager where you can add only one FTD. So, you go to that FTD, you have CLI. Everyone knows what is a CLI, right? So, you go to that CLI, you uh, check what is that device, you check what is the operation, everything. You can do that. You can add only one device to it. FMC on the other hand is a management center. You can add hundreds of FTDs to that. You can manage multiple sites. For example, you have an FTD physically in Australia. One is in US. How will you manage it using Onbox? Right? So, you are the only admin available. That is how you uh, manage your FTDs. So, you can use different policies. For example, so you can create a global ACL policy, global NAT policy. And then you would want to, to apply to all the FTDs that are available. So, you do not have to now go into each box separately 
enable acl for the same internet rule deny the same malicious traffic to each box now you can go to the uh, same uh, the centralized management center go there create your global acls choose the device you want to deploy it for and you just deploy it that is how the fmc makes it easier uh, to manage devices <clears throat> so uh, this part where we have the firewall os right so this is where the snort comes into picture okay you get the idea right so uh, yeah so uh, when we were discussing asa right there was this question why do we need nat at the same place why do we nat for everything it's because how ftd operates the underlying is same it operates how asa operates so each packet will come each packet will go through different phases whenever they hit the firewall first there will be an untranslation happening then there will be an acl check happening whether that traffic has an acl rule applied or not and then there will be a nat translation happening that's why the destination and the source translation is important like why do we want destination to destination mapping right because untranslation in asa happens first so we are always seeing what's the target is that target uh, in our acl in our nat or not if that target exists then only we hit that rule otherwise an implicit deny happens right so that is why that uh, destination translation source translation is important and once we have all the information from layer 3 layer 4 we come to data acquisition Uh, process. These are all processes that happens in the background. So there are like many engines that are running. This is called accelerated security path. Uh, tough thing to remember, but this is exactly how AS ASA works. So there is a, a security path through which each and every packet travels. They have to go through these paths. It depends whether you want all the paths to uh, run on those packets. You want to skip them. so based on whatever rules you create right sometimes you want the snort to not run on those packets so you go there you go to daq you disable it so it will not go through that snort hole inspection ssl decryption all those uh, rules it won't go through them it will skip them and it will just update the flow update the mpf checks and nat and everything and it will go to the layer 3 And layer four. Okay. Which question? Hmm. Ah, uh, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Because hackers are always one step ahead. It is a cat and mouse game. No matter how big of a security organization you are, no matter how much you pay your employees to secure the devices, there are people who get thrill from making attacks. So you. Because there is always junk food available. Because yeah, people are the weakest link. <laughs> yes. There is always something wrong that's going on. So best we can do is we can try to prevent and we can use whatever we have at our hands. So right. That's why we try to minimize human interaction as well when we come to you know firewalls, any devices, right? Because nowadays obviously automation is why we are doing it is to reduce the human error factor in all of these organizations. so i hope that answers the question who were asked so this is a glimpse of how fdm looks like this is the on box manager okay you have stand alone ftd you configured a manager just for that and you can view what are all the ports that are enabled uh, what are all the services that you can manage etc and ftd somehow looks like this i mean somewhat looks like this 
you can go to devices you have multiple devices there you can choose which device has which rules and uh, what are the events on all the devices on all particular devices etc so yeah i mean uh, similar to that you go to each of the interfaces that are available you create the setup however you want like from scratch you can get virtual images you can get on box images just like you have right uh, virtual os and on box os similar to that our topics yeah a more uh, pretty picture is here so here you have uh, vpns i'll cover that so to run both fdm and fmc you need licenses okay smart licenses so for example you have only 50 users connecting to your network through vpn through on prem or anything you might go for a lower license and you might opt an fdm like you have only one ftd 100 people connect to it 50 people connect to it you can manage with the uh, smart license that only enables that feature okay and then you can create most of the things you can create through fmc on fdm a bit tricky how to do that but it is feasible so depends on your design and deployment and interesting okay so like i was saying you guys know now cloud deployments right you know how important it is to shift from on prem the disadvantages of it someone has to go to the field always to be available if something goes wrong a lot of companies do not want to risk that nowadays okay and everything is moving to cloud so people fancy uh using cloud deployments if you want if you have azure services running for example if you have a cloud deployment where your aaa server also resides you want your firewall to be also connected to that through cloud right you want your computers you want all your ip services everything in the same place you can use same licenses for all of them similarly if you have aws you can you have licenses for that you use aws services vpcs vncs etc and the firewall uh, images also through that so different methods of deployment nowadays um most i mean still most of what we see are on premise deployments itself but slowly it's changing For, uh, with uh, the uh, with when we saw aws azure and all other cloud deployments that are coming in right even customers are moving from on premise to cloud deployments if they have existing infrastructure so the initial move is a bit difficult but if someone has existing infrastructure they can incorporate it easily so here is where the virtual image of that device for example you have so if you see here there is a managed devices right and there is cisco device managers right there so you can have just the device managers in cloud you can have physical ftds or you can have virtual ftds virtual managers as well in the cloud okay so it depends on your deployment your requirement how you are designing it and um uh, we have uh, you know use cases where fmc is through aws but the device itself the ftd itself is somewhere in physical location and that that can happen any questions so most of the ftd anyway like i said it's uh, uh, same as asa so even if you want to troubleshoot ftd you have to troubleshoot asa in the cli and we have not given the liberty to the customers to troubleshoot anything so to configure they need to go to the gui now in asa they had an option they could go to the cli configure everything just like you do any router or anything right now they cannot configure anything from cli it's all fancy uh, guis just like ice demo we saw right let's see if we can get that demo so any any questions so far in any interesting fact about ftd fmc you liked do you think this is making anyone's life easier not attackers of course but organizations 
admins right it's a very big shift you don't realize it now but as working i have seen where asa how asa worked and how ftd works so i see a huge difference between with the ease of uh, accessing the devices managing threats managing threats in asa is a bit difficult because you have to do everything from either cli or there is a manager called asdm but it's very difficult uh, it's, it's an old application which runs on java so we generally it doesn't work on all systems as well if a user wants to if a customer wants to manage their asas right so that is where uh, ftd is sometimes better mostly it is better we are actually uh, have plans to stop asa production so asa won't i think it has already started after a certain version there's no more asas there's only ftds that are being manufactured so the goal is for the migration so there there is a, a separate tool which is called uh, firepower uh, migration tool that we use so for example if i am a customer and i have asas 100 asas in my system and you are telling me to go to ftd because the production and support will stop on asa so how will i do that so manually if one asa has 10000 acls already obviously it's not feasible right not practical for them to do this so we have tools for that that migrate your configurations from asa to ftd directly so that is how we are uh, having the customers adapt to the uh, ftd scenario